First of all, why are we dealing with this topic? This topic deals with human nature because sins, mistakes, errors are something that human, humans are created upon. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam in an authentic hadith, Kullu bani adam khatta. Every son of Adam is prone to error, to mistake, to sin. And the best of those who err are those who repent. Now, we as Muslims fail miserably in a lot of cases when dealing with those who fall into error and mistakes and sins. Some of us fail to forbid evil. We fail to correct people's mistakes when we see them. And we live with it as nothing has changed or happened. No harm is done. I'm not forced to enjoin virtue and righteousness and forbid evil and vice. I don't have to. This is freedom of others. This is their own personal affairs. I should not intervene or have a say in it. And this is a huge mistake because it is part of our Iman. So it's an, it's an issue of Aqeedah. If you don't have it in you, your Iman is false. And the Prophet indicated and showed us the way when he said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, Whoever among you sees an evil action, let him change it with his hand. Meaning by taking action. So if you're a person of authority, you are a ruler, you are a Muslim judge, you are a policeman, you're a boss, you're a father, you're a husband, you have authority over those who are below you, you must take action. If he cannot, then with his tongue. You have to change this evil with your tongue, meaning by speaking out. And if he cannot, then with his heart, by at least hating it and resenting it and believing that it's wrong, and that is the weakest of faith. And this was narrated by Imam Muslim in the Sahih. What does this mean? It means that this is part of your Iman. And we know that Iman is 60 plus branches where the highest and the most elevated is La ilaha illallah. And the lowest is removing harmful things from people's way. So in order to fulfill these branches of Iman, you have to have this in you, the ability to change what is wrong, what is evil, what is munkar. Now, some do not say anything. Some say everything. So they're like the religious police. No one passes in front of them without telling them, don't do this or do that. As if they are in their ivory towers controlling people with their wand. And this is wrong. And if you add to this a rude behavior and arrogance and not being diplomatic, you do have a problem. Some of these enthusiastics may do these things out of their sincerity so they think not paying attention to a person's ignorance. May he may not be knowledgeable of the ruling. Not paying attention to the person's age. He might be a youngster. Or he might be an elder to you. He might be a parent. And you're speaking to them in such a rude fashion, thinking that you have the knowledge, you have the power to say whatever crosses your mind. Not being able to differentiate 
whether they've done this out of human nature and weakness at a time when they were vulnerable or they've done it out of defiance and arrogance and the likes. And this is something we will, inshallah, come to discuss in later times as we progress in these series bi azza wa jal. And such rudeness, such negative attitude from people who think that they have the ability and the right to control others made people repel against and away from Islam. They made them hate what they're preaching. Even if they're saying we're Salafis, we're this, we're that. No, you're not Salafis. You're super, super Salafis. You've not let any rock unturned. You've not let any scholar or da'i alone. You're like flies falling on dirt, not seeing the bigger picture, the better in people's behaviors, the attitudes, the positivity in them. This made people hate Salafiyyah. This made people hate Sunnah because you're pushing it way beyond the boundaries. You're not able to differentiate between a bid'ah that takes someone out of the fold of Islam, like a ta'til, for example, the bid'ah of Jahmiyyahs, and a bid'ah of something that's disputed among scholars, like using, using the prayer beads. And you're using the same artillery to attack. And they're not the same. But this is what you think. Oh, he's Mubtadi'ah, he's this. I'm going to boycott them. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to tarnish their reputation wherever I go. And all what comes out of their mouth is not getting people closer to Allah, rather getting people away from Islam. This is not the right way of doing it. And it's something we could sit and talk and dispute upon for hours. However, as Muslims, we always refer back to the Qur'an and to the Sunnah. And the Prophet wasallam used to frequently inaugurate his speeches when addressing huge gatherings such as in the Eids, in the Jumu'ahs, in the Fridays, and in the likes. He used to say, the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad wasallam. And no Muslim argues about this. No Muslim would say, Ah, but I beg to differ. Because he would not be a Muslim if he thinks that anyone's guidance is equivalent or better than the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our Prophet. No Muslim would dare say this, though millions are actually believing in this and implementing it in their lives. But they dare not say it and speak it. So, the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our prophet, is the best of guidance without any doubt. Why? Because the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is supported by Allah. The prophet's rhetorics and actions are controlled and supervised by revelation from Allah azza wa jal. If they were sound and correct, then so be it. If the Prophet made a mistake, Allah would fix it and correct it on the spot as he does not utter a thing from his own whims and desires. Rather, it is a revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. Therefore, the methods of the Prophet والسلام, are the wisest. His methods are the most successful and when used, most likely, the people would respond positively to it. Why? Because it is the methods of the Prophet والسلام, whom Allah ordered us to take him as a role model and to follow his methods and ways in life. And if we do this with the correct intention, we will be also rewarded for it. So it's a win-win both ways. People will adhere, people will learn and accept, and you will be rewarded at the side of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now it's worth noting 
that when you dive in the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, and reap the fruits from all these trees in the garden of the sunnah, you will find that he used different methodologies and ways. And this means that it's not one size that fits all. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ was soft and easygoing, as in the case of the person who urinated in the masjid. The way he asked his companions to stop and not to interfere until the man is over with what he's doing, although it's in the middle of the masjid, and the way he spoke to him afterwards in a very kind and diplomatic and fatherly way, in contrast with how he dealt with his own companions, such as Abu Dharr, may Allah be pleased with him, when he, in, in, in a fight, in rage, said to Bilal, the Abyssinian, while he was fighting with him, he could not control his emotions and he said, your mother is black. This is racism. And this racist comment did not go unnoticed. The Prophet said, you are a man of ignorance. And Abu Dhar was among the first to embrace Islam in the history of Islam. And he said, oh Prophet of Allah, after this age, and I'm a person of ignorance? He said, yes, due to your racist comment. When he saw a man wearing a golden ring, he was outraged and he went to him, snatched the ring out of his finger and tossed it away and said, why would any one of you go to a stone of fire and place it in his hand and left? Now, compare this to this, you'd find that there are reasons and only scholars and people of wisdom and knowledge can differentiate when to use this method of advising people, person urinating in the masjid, and when to use such harsh words, like he said to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with them, when he came once with clothes that were dyed in yellow and saffron, yellow or orange. And this was one of the characteristics of the idol worshippers. This is solely for them to wear. But being a, young, a youngster and thought that this looked hip, so he wore these and went to meet the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet did not say to him, what are you doing, my son? This is wrong. No, he said, did your mother order you to wear these clothes? That was really aggressive, but it was due to a wisdom and a purpose. Coming from the Prophet ﷺ, we know that sometimes you have to be this aggressive. You have to be blunt and straightforward. And sometimes you have to beat around the bush, you have to be diplomatic, you have to say few things that may help those you're trying to give advice and to correct their mistakes. So this is up to your ishtihad. And ishtihad doesn't come out of thin air. It comes from looking into the sunnah, weighing the pros and the cons, trying to figure out the circumstances and whether it fits the scenario you're approaching or you should use another uh, uh, approach and this only is given to those who have knowledge who have wisdom those who have fiqh and understanding so that they can match things together and be able to know what is most likely to be used here and most likely to be used there now there would be a number of guidelines and points that we should pay attention to, but probably we would delay this, inshallah, till tomorrow. And